I'm going to talk about Brad Borg today. Um, Geographic uh, model group of cycling. Uh, and I most of the time work with this company. Uh, I just, uh, we also look for developers, so we look for a job in Vienna and talk to me afterwards. So, Bradford, uh, is it, should I make it bigger or can you read it in the back? Uh, Breadboard says on its box is the solidest way uh, to wire up your application components. For some stupid reason, Firefox doesn't remember the Zoom settings if you look at files. Uh, it's uh, Brad Ball by Steve Little. Um, yeah, you can see them. Um, and like the first thing it says about Brad Ball is uh, Brad Ball is an inverter control framework that focuses on dependency injection and lifecycle management. And then I read it, it was like, okay, Brad Ball is about it. Fuck, is it talking about framework? Something with syringe and Buddhism? <laughs> I really have no idea what it, what it, what it is. Um, Uh, so I'll try to explain this uh, in the next few slides, but first, what is the name? It's not a thing. When I first heard it as a native German speaker, I had no idea about hardware hacking. When I, think, when I hear Brad Ward, I think about something like that. I think they're going to cut, right? What's that? But apparently for English speakers or people who hack on hardware, Brad Ward is, is which still doesn't tell me anything. Um, <laughs> Uh, video, but in the end, it's something where you can you know, put some microchip components in it and sort of stitch that together without having to actually solder anything. Or so another name makes a bit more sense. Uh, a solder is a way to wire up the application framework uh, components. Uh, and apparently, that trout is to blame for the name. So, okay, in work of control, that's what Wikipedia has to say about it. It's a uh, programming technique. Um, in which object coupling is built at runtime uh, and not uh, at compile time using uh, It took me again quite a lot of time to understand that IOC source a problem that doesn't really exist in Perl, in my opinion. Or sort of doesn't exist. Uh, because the key point is this object coupling is bound at runtime, but it's a dynamic language, it's a very dynamic language, you can do everything you fucking want at runtime. Uh, so the compile time setting in the business part isn't really that relevant for Perl. Uh, but the decoupling thing is, um, so decoupling of course is good, um, uh, because it allows us to specify, develop, and test those very small uh, fragments, distinct units, uh, which do one thing and do it very properly and do it good, and then we can later stick them together uh, to build our application. A little bit like you know, Lego. Um, yes, we can do stuff like that in Perl. Um, uh, or of course, C-Pen. Uh, but in my opinion, in workload control is just an overly complex password used by system architects. Uh, so, uh, we get over the obvious practice, sound very serious and, you know, mm. sounds like orthogonal or even potent. So, if you see this, it's just like password being your bullshit. Um, Lifecycle management is easy. Uh, Red Ball also specify how long certain object channels exist, uh, or rather how often it should be immediately initialized. Is it, is it, is it, is it a single thing you want it once, or it should be initiated every time you need it? Um, so I see the password. Lifecycle management is easy. It leaves dependency injection. It also has a nice Wikipedia definition. Um, 
Yeah, so it, it's about to remove a part of the dependencies and make it possible to change them with a better plant of Python or Spira. Anyway, so the real core of Brad, that's the real core of what Brad brought us. Um, so, but doing dependency injection is so, so incredibly easy that you probably have done it for ages. Uh, so, the, here's where the example starts. Here's a, a very simple example uh, a small script which will fetch something in our RSS feed from STD, IT, which is a site that provides links to uh, TV series, uh, torrent files. Um, and this script shall report all of the new TV series, uh, season one, episode one. Start the turns around so I can see if I'm probably interested in that season as you I don't care what's happening on TP, I can sort of handle on small files. And, yeah, but. So here's a small wrapper script that, uh, that runs that thing. Uh, as you see, it's nearly empty because it, uh, uh, it uses a class, everything is implemented in the class. We initiate the class and we call run on the object to get back to the class. So that's a boring script which is what script should look like. There's a template, which is even more boring. Um, and now, so here's an example of how to not do it. Um, it's a tiny bit, you can read it. Um, so let's go through it. So we have a few objects. We need a few user agents, XML feed, number format, and template of the toolkit. We have a run method, which basically does the remaining steps of the program, which are, uh, oops. Fetch something, pass it, and then report it. So here's the fetch method, uh, which basically initiates an empty user agent object, um, and then later calls something and does some stuff. Uh, we have the find method, which again uses two objects, number format and XML feed puzzle. Um, and then we have the write method, which just reports everything, and that's using empty toolkit. And everything is initiated in line, which is a very simple, straightforward way to do it. Uh, but it is impossible to replace these objects with other objects. So you cannot pass in another configuration, you cannot pass in other objects of other classes. For example, you can't replace any the user agent with Mojo user agent or some other new shiny thing. You cannot define a okay for another format, for example, or you cannot use another templating engine if there is another templating engine. Uh, and even more about you cannot use mock objects during testing. Um, so this is the problem that dependency injection wants to solve. So here's another example that's a little bit better. Uh, he removed all of the objects out of the methods where they're used into the, into the main body of the module. So they are initiated at, at load time, at body load time, which is basically the time stored in the package variable. This is basically just a performance improvement because now instead of initiate the object every time you run the method, you initiate them once, so now I have sync um, uh, Because it might be expensive to initiate the object, uh, but it still sucks because you can't replace the executable scope object uh, from the outside. Using package clearance would be an option, but not the 90s anymore, don't do it. Um, so there's the checks and dependencies. Um, so instead of building the Dependencies inside your object or your methods or your classes, you eject them from the outside, which basically means you pass them in. It's just basic parameter passing. Um, so instead of defining the dependencies inside the object, let's define them outside. Uh, this is the script we, we use to uh, call the, the, the class. And now in the script, we uh, just initiate all the objects. And then later we pass them to the run method. Uh, and now the run method, of course, has to be modified to take out the objects that it needs and then pass them around again. Uh, so while you can now inject dependencies, so this is dependency injection, yeah, something you've probably done for 10 years or even longer. This is very ugly and very efficient way to do it uh, because, of course, you have to pass all the objects around to the other objects and, and the other methods. Uh, inside the class, it's not really obvious what you need. So if you just look at the code of the, of the class, you don't see what object it depends on. And if you have to reuse the class in another script or another context, you have to reinitiate all the, all the objects. You have to copy this set of code. That's fucking hell. Do you remember what we talked from last year? Um, 
So another thing you can do is uh, to uh, put all of, the, of this dependency objects into attributes of the class. So we use moves to get some nice and cheap attributes, uh, which we define using head. Um, uh, for a change, instead of uh, hard coding the names of the classes, I use stack title here, which is quite funny. You need to use this new user time constraint thing. And then you can say, I accept any object that has a method called get, or a method called found by, or something like that. It's quite nice. Uh, um, yeah, and then in one of the methods, you still get only the object, and then you have the accessor, and you can call methods on it. And you have a thing. Of course, you still, need to, you still need to initiate the object, again, in the calling script. Uh, so the script now looks like this, the same. Uh, and here, when we call the, the object we are working with, uh, we need to pass in the attributes and set them with whatever objects we want. Um, so now we don't have to pass the objects around in our code because they're stored uh, in, the, in the attributes of our object. But we still need to set them up in the calling script, and so we still need to do this for every context. So it still sucks. One idea now is to use lazy building, which is a feature of Moose. Probably everybody knows it anyway. Um, so we can have the attributes. We add, for example, the lazy build flag. It's one way to do it. And then we add a build method, which of course has to be named, has to be named underscore build underscore name of the attribute. And now if you do not set a user agent when initiating initiate the object, Moose will automatically build a call this method and build an object like that. Um, so the script is now again very empty as it should be, and these scripts are nice. Um, but now I can easily pass in other objects than the default ones, while still having the default. For example here, uh, that's the script, which here you need, uh, has another, another class defined in line. It's not the nicest way to do it, but it was too lazy to put it in another file. Um, so here's a mock LEP class, um, which is sort of behaves like an LEP user agent. Um, the point is it has a hard-coded string. Uh, we always return that string, which is quite handy for testing because you always get the same results. And it's also quite handy if you're without the network, for example, on a plane or at a conference. Um, yeah, and so this is what well, uh, That's enough to fake any user agent for my process. And now when I initiate my object, uh, uh, initiate the user agent and pass it in. And the rest of the object are lazily built using, using the lazy build feature of most. But for user agent, I want to have this object. So that's now it's starting to get nice. Um, and I used setups like this for years. And was quite happy. There were a few problems. One annoying problem. Okay, that's not the problem. One of the things when we're using moves, or when I use moves, is I tend to put a lot of stuff into roles. Um, for example, one thing I usually do is the database connection. Uh, you know, it's the code that figures out which database to connect to, what's the username, what's the password, and stuff like that. So I often end up with roles like this. Um, I've got some that here somewhere. So it's a, it's a role, it has a database handle. And it has a method to figure the database handle, and what's missing here is the fancy code to figure out which database to connect, what's the name of the database, what's the name of the database user, and all that stuff. Just imagine it here. The point is to turn the finished database handle that I can use to do stuff. And this would be a part of the application that needs a database, so it applies a role, and it has a do something method which does something with the database. So it's quite nice and straightforward. Problem starts when you have another part of the application that needs another part of your application. But like here, the, the B part needs the A part. And inside some other methods, we initiate a new object of this A type and do something with it and then do something with the other database thing. So now what you would assume would happen is that 
Both of those things use the same database connection, but they don't. Uh, they use two different database connections because here a new database connection is initiated, which is annoying because you also get two different transactions, for example. So you cannot see changes you do here in this in this code. We had a very annoying problem with some logging in, in that uh, problem. The easy fix for that, of course, is um, to initiate that object with the database application. Some other places, but in the end, you start out with a lot of spaghetti code. And, uh, and another uh, performance related problem of this approach is that you always load all of the dependencies and all of the classes. So, for example, even if you do not have a, use a particular attribute in one use case, uh, you still need to load it. For example, in this mock example I showed you earlier, NDP user, you still need, as Tim said, use NDP user agent. So, if you uh, compile the module, it still gets loaded and adds to the memory footprint of your script. Even you don't need it. And fucking around with uh, conditional loading of modules, I mean, you could do it, but it's, and it's getting easier thanks to load class. But, yeah. um, but we could live with this problem, so sort of like around them, and we did it for years. But then we discovered something called OX, uh, and with it, Brad Ford. OX is, has <laughs> the name of the two hardest working letters on, in Perl. Um, it's an application framework based on breadboard, powerful the PSGI. I wouldn't say it's a rewrite of Catalyst, but it's, it's an application framework that has learned from some of the problems Catalyst has. And it's not a small application framework like Dance or Traditions. Um, Okay, the philosophy behind the box is that the bidding box of an application should just click together without the overhead of an additional plugin scheme or glue layer, which is a nice way to say we don't need fucking capitalist model of classes or everywhere, which is the most annoying part of capitalism, in my opinion, that for every thing you want to use, you are supposed to make a model class in between. I mean, of course, you can use it directly, but then the configuration. It's, it's nice, it's a cool thing, but uh, uh, the problem with Catalyst is that it works as an application framework, but if you want to reuse part of the things you use in Catalyst outside of that application framework, work things start to get a little bit complicated. And one of the things Ox tries to solve is that problem. Um, in 2012, they published a very nice event calendar, Ox event calendar, where they explain the concepts and everything. It's from e uh, so smart people. Very nice tool. Anyway, um, so this got us interested in the breadboard, so we took a look at that. And here's how we could implement that using breadboard. Um, one thing you notice here is that we, in, in the, the class, we do not use any user agent or anything, it's completely gone from here. Um, also, gone is the lazy building, which has the attributes. Um, and what we, what we now need instead of all this is breadboard and breadboard container. Um, so I have a class which basically returns a breadboard container. Go for it. It's just a plain class that uses breadboard. Uh, this set of things is something I like to do. It's just a method that you can call it. It gives you back a, a breadboard container. Um, so, breadboard itself has two basic building blocks, uh, containers and services. You can think of containers as namespaces that can contain services, or other containers that can have nested things. And the service is basically an object, an instance of a class, which is not really true. Actually, a service provides the information you need to initiate an object of a class. And some other hints about that object, or how you want to initiate it. So, here's a container that's called Couch Potato. Um, you can assume that Couch Potato is a big framework I use to make my TV habits uh, easier. My TV viewing habits. Which it doesn't exist, it's just. Um, uh, yeah, and Find Your Series uh, is one piece of this big application framework I use to watch TV. 
Um, and that's very important. Bread bot really makes no sense for small applications or small scripts. The app was really, really only based off if you have something big that you want to use in a lot of different contexts. So, okay, back to the server. We have a container, then we define a service. Uh, and the service has uh, some options that you can define here. A very important one is class, which defines the class you want to initiate. And then, for example, you can define the dependencies. So, what other things does this object need to be successfully initiated? Um, in this case, you need the build agent, you need the formatter, and the wrapper. But the dependence is how to resolve not a little bit strange here, for example, with the, some sort of path. Um, and this means that we can find information how to, how to initiate that in this other container component that you use agent. You can also use relative, um, relative addressing here and just other options, but that's, that's the same as the way I found. Um, so let's look at those other containers, uh, uh, components. So there's a container called component, which is the components I need for my applications. Uh, it's just a definition service as a user agent, um, which is an editing user agent, and should be a thing even. So in the whole life cycle of this script, or, or, or in the runtime, basically, it should only be initiated once so for performance reasons or whatever. Um, you can fine tune the object uh, recreation to passing in the block. Another, another option, there are some other options which are randomly used, so those are the ones I use most of the time. And block is just so you can have whatever code you want in here to initiate the object. In this case, I call template to new, template new with some include mark. Uh, this is still simple. Of course, you can define very big and long chain of dependencies. Um, and Breadboard will resolve all those dependencies as lazy as possible and on, uh, as on demand as possible. So you can have a lot of stuff, but Breadboard will only actually load the classes that you actually use. So, how do we run it? It's the calling script again. Um, we need to use the Breadboard class. Um, Call a setup, setup method on the which returns is the actually breadboard object. And on that breadboard object, we can call resolve with some parameters. In that case, we want the service name find the series. And what we get back is an initiated, an initiated object of that class with all the dependencies as we define them in the breadboard. And then we can run some run it. Yeah. Um, that seems like very much fast for not a lot of uh, output. Um, or actually, it didn't look like, like, like a setback because now we have a hard coded class and an editing user agent in the breadboard. And in the earlier example, it was, I didn't care about the, uh, the class name. I'll show some examples later in a few minutes uh, how to uh, work around it. Um, because there's one more thing which is, took me quite some time. It's called parameterized containers. Every time you ask an IRC something about uh, how they do it in, in Breadboard, you get the answer of parameterized containers. But there is hardly any documentation, or there used to be hardly any documentation. Uh, and it took me the writing of two blog posts, extensive IRC on Breadboard, and some experimenting to figure something out that, that worked for us. I'm going to show you now, so maybe if you use it, you have a little bit less work to do. Um, that's a complex enough example of parameterized containers. The font size gets smaller because the code gets smaller. Um, again, you have the setup method in, uh, in this breadboard class, which now uh, takes another parameter called environment name, which is something I made up, which is the official breadboard thing. Um, and that thing is basically just a method you call. Um, and this method will return a breadboard container. Here's an example for one such method for uh, where we return a container called the production, where we find um, my services and my dependencies, but instead of defining them in line, I use something called alias where I call alias, but I can basically link something to something else. This is clear when you look at another um, environment, 
for example, the dev environment for, the, for development, um, where I again use the yields that now now are called the mocked uh, objects. So instead of calling and I'm using the development environment, I don't want to use the proper object, but some other object. So I get back this container, which is a port container, and then I need to somehow tell Brent board that I want to pass in another container as a parameter, which looks like this. So you can container couch potato, and in between you can pass in a list of names, um, which has an environment or env. And then when you actually call the Brent board, you have to pass it in the container. So that thing is just this is the definition and this is how you use it. And here you can see, hopefully, um, that now in the generic container, I use env, user internal env renderer. And this env will resolve to either the, the what I define in the production container or in the development container, depending on what I'm passing. And the nice thing is that this name here is defined here and here, and uh, so I can you know, plug in different things depending on whatever, on my environment. Um, yeah. Yeah, this is just a simple example of how to define the environment. I just take a look at the arc v0, the first command argument, or default to the production. Um, so now we have a bad container that contains information on how to initiate all the potential objects we might need. And the reader asks for how to initiate our objects. Um, but if this example is way too simple to really legitimate the board. That's a lot of overhead from really nothing. I mean, if, if, you, if, that, if that was all you want to do, just don't use the board. Just use it or something. Um, so here's a real life example. Um, Um, we use this following brand ball in the project we're currently developing or hacking on. Um, and it uses the, the, set, the parameter as container concept that I just showed you. That's the brand ball. It's a bit long. Um, so I can show you a small, uh, just some, some excerpts of this form in 20 lines. Uh, I don't have, oh, I don't have the highlighting. Um, Okay, you see the same environment hack as earlier. We have one container called app, which contains all the applications we actually want to run. For example, one application is called render service worker, which is of some class and has a long list of dependencies. Um, most of them are environment based, so you depend on whatever environment you're passing. Some of them are hard coded because that's not environment specific yet. I mean, you can change it later. Um, here's another service called Beth, that's basically the web front end. That thing, the render service worker is a small script that does something. It runs on several machines and it communicates with the rest of the system via CRM queue. It's um, just a you know, the plan of things to run thousands of that thing and only one of that thing. Um, so, but you see that they use a lot of similar things, really, that thing or the or, uh, localizer. So they share some components, they don't share all components. Uh, have a different set of components. Um, that's a more complicated example of how to define a service. Um, the service is named default parameters of TT, so it's a template toolkit default parameters. Um, which depends on something else. And you can see here in the block definition, um, you can, uh, in this code, which gets a run to, uh, to, uh, to initiate the other object, you can uh, depend on something, and here you can uh, access that. So you can have sort of, you can access the other dependencies inside your dependencies. Um, this thing is only used here in this wrap thing to set up a template toolkit uh, object, which uses this default parameters and another parameter. Here's another template toolkit image that, is, that doesn't use the, the wrap, uh, the wrapper. So it's 
So we use that for the full website. And then ping when we only want to you know, show a fragment that's going to be loaded via jQuery. Um, so now with all our components defined in breadboard, we don't need some special scripts to run different applications, so that's one of the fun things. We have one generic script, which we can use to run every component of our system. Uh, we just use a sort of hack to figure out which service we want to use via the name of the symlink. So that's some of the scripts. As you can see, most of them are symlinks to one other script, which is this one. Each of these things is a standalone service, that's either a web service or a daemon or something, or it could be a cron or whatever. That's a sort of the script down version of this, of this administration script. Um, it uses the red board here, it sort of figures out from the script name, which you get in Brother Zero, um, what the name of the service should be. Um, you can still pass in an environment via the command line, either via the command line or the environment, or it falls to the development environment. And then we initiate our platform, set up the, the, uh, put the environment in it, and then uh, get the service, whatever it is. And then we just run it. So it's one script for everything. That's quite nice. Um, as you may have noticed, this application consists of lots of different services. They have to, all of them uh, have to be running. Some of them have to be started in some order, which is okay at the server, but on the development machines that's very annoying. So we have another script, which is called CD fork application, which basically uh, starts everything in the right, in the, in the right order via forking. So we have a list of services we need. So we need that, that, and then from here we need two of, of those, two instances of those scripts, that could be of 20, whatever. Uh, again, we set up a breadboard. If you only want, we have hard coded the development breadboard because that's something you only use as a development machine. Um, and then we go through the services, if it's a dash, just sleep a little bit. Um, and uh, then if it's not a dash, fork a new uh, process, or remember the, the, the child kit and stuff. And then uh, in the child process, initiate this application. And this initiate the application, you have to get the report, get the service name, resolves the service, gets the object back, and runs it. So it's a very nice way to start like 20 different scripts in, in one script, all using the same uh, system. Uh, another thing uh, is that. Yeah, of course, you need more services which are taken to the server. Um, here's another script that's not really a service instead. It's basically a maintenance script or some, some, some throwaway script uh, that dumps some random data to the database so the designers have something to play with. Um, this uses some objects by itself. Uh, but it still uses red board to resolve all of those smaller objects. You know, those smaller objects are basically services or components, most of them. And I can now just, in this script, I, need no, I don't need a whole application or a whole service, I just need a few of those objects. So I can ask red board to give me those and do something with them. Yeah, do something, but that's not very interesting. Um, yeah. The last example, uh, here's an example that uses breadboard to test the NOX controller. It's a little complicated here. But, um, so, what is data? Uh, okay, so that's, you see here it's called test sim, so that, that's an, a library that lives inside our test suite, we use it only for testing. And it's basically a the library that helps us to test uh, controllers. So it uses some plug and aux things. It again has a bad board. Here we use it. This is the boost trigger for the order to initiate the bad board object by default. Always using the test environment. Um, and then it has one method, for example, which did not really finish, as you can see here. Um, it loads some control cards and then initiates all of the uh, services. What it says here to do, that's something I've implemented here. 
Uh, as Brent Ward is basically the most tooth glass, you can use, it, you can use introspection uh, on the most object uh, to figure out actually what they're doing. This is now hard coded for one use case. Um, there are some other methods, helper methods in this test slip, so that it's another good thing to do if you, if you write tests, put them into, put, just generate some test libraries, that would be the stuff you needed a lot. Um, anyway, so one really nice thing about Ox is uh, that you can very easily unit test uh, controller actions. It's just a method call, and it's just an object. There's no fussing around with forking the server, or running your back application, which you need to do in other application frameworks, which means faster tests because you don't have to load the whole application. For example, in Catalyst, I mean, I really like uh, the PSGI testing thing. I don't remember the name. PSGI test or test PSGI or something, where you can just start up the application and instead of forking, you know, another application and then run an MVP user agent or, uh, or uh, uh, WW mechanized tests on the fork application. Using PSGI, you can just have it inside your process so that it saves you some overhead. But still, if you do that, in Catalyst, you have to load the whole application. So if you have 50 controller classes, and you want to test one of it uh, using Catalyst, uh, you just load everything when you, when you initiate the object, uh, the, the application class. Using Ox, you don't have to do that because one controller is just a class that is very well defined because it gets all of the uh, attributes it needs via brand board. Uh, so if you want to test it, you can you really just test the controllers. It's plain unit testing, like when you test a class. That's very nice. Um, so what's that? That's one test, um, which uses a lot of fixtures and helper methods and stuff. In the end, this thing here, um, uh, loads the controller class user, figures we have out via breadboard what dependencies this controller class has, initiates an object of the class, and gives it back the class. It also gives back the DLC object, and it also starts a transaction. So when I'm done with the test, I can just say rollback, and the database is clean again. Um, yeah, and that's just a, a fixture. Also a nice trick if you want to you know, test your database, have some fixture classes to return some data set. This is the use of Bart, which is Bart Simpson. Uh, uh, yeah. So we have some uh, venues to test again. And then the actual test, which is, this is just a method call. We pass some parameters. You get back, um, yeah, that's basically a wrapper we wrote to make it a little bit easier. But at the end, it passes that, uh, oh, I don't remember. <laughs> uh, but in the end, you get back the result. And the thing is, there's no HTTP involved, there's no PSGI involved, it's just method calls. And yeah, that's sort of made possible by Bradford. So that's the thing where then you, you, know, you can read the efforts you put into setting up all these horrible services and containers. So the summary, Bradford is very complex and it uses a lot of work when you use it the first time or when you use it to set up your application the first time. But after you have mastered it, or as I you know, sort of <laughs> understand it, um, it's very easy to have lots of many different application components, which you can then use in a lot of different concepts, uh, contexts. So if you have a big application consisting of lots of services, Brandboard might be a nice tool to 